it's not every day that you trip over bugs and find problems, even if somebody was going to shell out the $1.6 million it would take to license Microsoft SQL Server for this super micro system. This is probably the fastest system on the planet running Microsoft SQL Server, and oh boy, Glenn Berry and I, we found some bugs, and we had some adventures. <laughs> Well, we got something very special for you today. I'm joined by Mr. Glenn Barry, MVP, SQL expert, and uh, I needed him to take apart some things <laughs> as we wanted to do a bunch of testing across a bunch of different servers. Intel, like who's faster? Genoa, Genoa, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, the new SP5 platform from AMD. Intel Sapphire Rapids with their accelerators. QAT puts up a good, pretty good fight. And he's also committed to a Threadripper system, which is desktop, which is a little different class. And maybe, like, we had a whole different class of problems than we were expecting, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Say hello. And let's, let's, let's talk about it. Hey, well, I'm really happy to be working with you on this, and I had a lot of fun on these three systems. And basically, we, we built a two terabyte database with 24 data files in SQL Server 2022, and we played with several different systems to see how fast we could get it to back up that database using different methods. So that's kind of a high level of what we tried to do. And there were a lot of challenges and bottlenecks we ran into as we were doing that. At, at the end of the day though, backing up a two terabyte database in production, most people expect that to take 45 minutes, an hour. Yeah. But on these test systems, we can do it in under a minute. Kind oh of. yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we got it down to 34 seconds. So, and that's an actual backup with no compression. Using a backup to null, we got it down to 14 seconds. So that's kind of mind blowing. <laughs> 14 seconds to back up a two terabyte database. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. It, it doesn't necessarily even require that you have 1.5 terabytes of memory. It's like, oh, we'll just cache it all into memory. It's like, no, this is, these were committed writes. They made it to a block device. Yeah. Definitely. You know, so we, we ran several different tests. We did a backup to null, which is basically just reading all the data in the database and throwing it away. And then we did a backup with no compression, which is a lot of people do. And then we did two different forms of software compression. We did legacy Microsoft Express compression that's been around since 2008. And then we tried the new Intel software-based compression, QAT compression. And then we did hardware-assisted QAT compression. So we did those tests on this database with lots of different configuration settings and lots of messing around with the drives to try to maximize our throughput. That's basically our bottleneck here is read sequential throughput from the storage subsystem and then memory throughput and then finally write sequential throughput writing to the backup files using consumer ssds in place of enterprise ssds that is a recipe for disaster in the enterprise but in our case we wanted to see what the system would do making it go as fast as possible and we very quickly encountered some very obvious bugs one, it's pretty clear that Microsoft is not really doing a lot of testing around 128 core SQL servers. I mean, sure, the license is wildly expensive, but our dual 96 core Genoa system here was definitely not behaving as it should. It could be handily outperformed by a dual 32 core system in a lot of cases. Now, for me, that was counterintuitive because in the preliminary testing and looking at how SQL servers used real world, almost always it's more of a CPU bottleneck. And I think that's what you were encountering on your own storage beast system. Yeah. And when you've got fewer cores and you do a striped backup, what happens is you get lots of CPU pressure. That more, The more stripes you add, and a striped backup, by the way, is just instead of writing to one backup file, you have multiple files and they can be on the same drive or they can be striped across different physical drives like we did here. So doing that puts a lot more pressure on the CPU. So that's why I was pegging my Threadripper system at 100% doing that for this testing. And we didn't have that problem on the Genoa or Sapphire Rapid systems when they had a lot more cores available. But one interesting thing though that we ran into, which is probably a SQL Server bug, I'm gonna go ahead and say it definitely is, but I don't think you're quite as sure, is uh, we have so many cores that it doesn't seem like SQL Server was recognizing all of the cores and using them appropriately. Because even though we had more cores available, the software-based backup didn't seem like it took advantage of that. No, it didn't here. And, you know, SQL Server, 
when it starts up, writes an entry to the SQL Server error log that tells you how many cores it can see. And that was picking up all the cores in the Sapphire Rapids and Genoa systems. But there's a, a different query you can run that looks at what the Newman nodes inside of SQL Server can see. And that was only picking up 64 logical cores per Numa node. And that's way below what we had available in those two systems. So I think that was part of the problem we were running into, running the QAT software compression. Uh, just to give the, the audience an idea of the, these systems, these are pretty much top of stack for, from both Intel and AMD. Both of them were super micro systems. Our super micro system with Genoa had dual 96 core CPUs. These are really not super realistic for what you'd be running on a, on a bare metal SQL Server workload. Maybe you would be running a bunch of SQL Server VMs, but I, I don't think that there's, there's probably, what, five, six customers worldwide running a system like that? Yeah, because SQL Server licensing costs for enterprise edition with that many cores is really going to be very expensive. So most people are running on much smaller systems, whether it's bare metal or virtualized. So you're absolutely right there. Our other system, which was Sapphire Rapids based, also super micro, because we tried to be as like for like as we could, was uh, based around uh, the 48 core. Oh, I can't remember the, the designation. I think it was the 44 core, 48 core Sapphire Rapids, 8368. No, 84. No, it was a, yeah, it was a 44 core, and then it was an Intel Xeon Platinum 8458P is what it was. So. Yeah, one of the top of the line Sapphire Rapid SKUs. I was hoping that the extra clock speeds on that, because usually if you have a little bit fewer cores, you get a little bit better boost performance, but it didn't really seem to help us much here. No, it didn't. And interesting, you know, I ran CPU Z and Geekbench, and they were pretty close between the Genoa and the Sapphire Rapids on those two benchmarks. So they're fairly evenly matched for single threaded performance. So part of our goal here was one, to use all the PCIe lanes, and two, to make this thing go as fast as we possibly could. We had to get out our uh, U.2 cheat codes, and we used 24 IC doc M.2 to U.2 adapters, along with Solidime P44 Pro SSDs, because they were the fastest SSDs we could get for this job, even faster than Samsung SSDs. Well, for these five tests, the storage beast won on two of the tests. So it won on no compression because it had slightly better uh, IO performance than the Genoa system did because I had a lot of uh, Samsung 990 drives in there where you had a lot of 980s. And it's kind of funny to say that a Samsung 980 is slow, but it was, <laughs> it was in this test. So we won no compression on storage beasts, and then QAT software also the storage beast won because it has faster single threaded performance than either one of the server systems. And then the Genoa system won on backup to null because it had more memory throughput than my Threadripper did. And remember, all we're doing is reading everything and throwing it away. So having lots of read sequential throughput on the storage subsystem and then memory throughput is all you care about there. And then also it won on the Microsoft Express legacy software compression, the Genoa system won. And then finally, the Sapphire Rapid system won on the QAT hardware compression because it was using the built-in QAT accelerator inside of the CPU. So even though it had less storage performance, it actually won that test. And that's what that feature is designed for. So it worked as advertised in that test. Yeah, the, the nice thing about the QAT uh, acceleration is that it really does work is advertised and to help everybody understand it's not a feature in a cpu core it's actually more like a pcie peripheral that's built into the cpu it's a sort of a memory based accelerator and, and we're, we're fortunate because we also have numbers because you mailed me a pcie 3.0 quick assist accelerator you know in, in the before times intel was doing these kinds of accelerators on pcie cards which are actually pretty good and even if you have a SQL server that's fully CPU pegged, you use this accelerator, whether built in or on a PCIe card, and it does not add really any CPU overhead. So it doesn't, you know, when you're running a backup, your users can't really feel that because the system's not busy dealing with that. That may be IO. Yeah, you know, that card that I sent you is an older 2018 vintage uh, QAT8970 card. 
And it works as advertised also. It offloads that backup compression workload from your regular cores to that card, and it lets you run your regular workload with less of an effect from the backup compression. And with that, it was still holding its own even in, you know, 2023. It's, you know, I know not, 2018 is basically the 1970s in computer years, but yeah. still doing pretty good. Yeah, I wish that Intel would come out with a newer version of that. So if you wanted to run that on a Genoa system, you could, but they don't have a whole lot of incentive to do that. So and there hasn't been any announcements about it yet. Now, I have picked up some more Sapphire Rapid CPUs workstation versions, and I found that the QAT accelerator is disabled. But there may be a way to, to get it turned back on. I don't know yet. We're going to have to save that for a future video. Yeah, that'll be fun to play with if we can get that turned on. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to be shoving PCIe 3 peripherals in a PCIe 5 slot. Just It's like, why? Why do you Yeah, do it's such no? a waste. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. I think um I think also it's probably worth setting up a single socket Genoa system that's more akin to what people would probably use with with SQL Server and see how that goes because the CPU for your Threadripper system to be as CPU pegged as it was, the Genoa system was disproportionately not pegged. It's wasting cycles somewhere beyond not just not using the cores and, and the single thread performance, but I, it was it was not obvious where or what was going on. Yeah, well, it'd be nice if we can get our hands on some PCIe Gen 5 drives to use for this testing. You know, we've been just using Gen 4 drives, so that's kind of our bottleneck on some of these tests. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. We're also, we're, we're going a little off-label here in that enterprise drives, especially even enterprise PCIe 5 drives, um, are architected differently than consumer drives. And so in order for us to, to pull out what we have here, you with your 990s and, and me with my 980s and later Solidime SSDs, um, they perform way differently than enterprise drives. And enterprise drives are perform worse, but you can count on an enterprise drive to perform consistently over the lifetime of the drive and no matter what the capacity of the drive is. With the drives that we're using in these servers, you, it's really not something anybody should ever actually do with their systems, because as the as their database gets larger, the performance is going to tank substantially, and that's why no one uses these kinds of drives in an actual real server. Oh yeah, that's that's the trade-off. You know, you get consistency and endurance with enterprise drives, but you don't get the absolute peak performance that a client drive gets. And and one thing that I had to be careful about with this testing is that most uh, consumer drives are TLC, and they have a small SLC write cache, or relatively small. And you've got to be careful that you don't exhaust that, or when you do exhaust that, you'll see a huge drop off in your sequential write performance. So depending on what kind of test you're doing here, you can run into that when you're doing this sort of benchmark testing. Uh, not just TLC, also QLC, especially the newer yeah. ones. Like the, well, the 990s technically, I think, are QLC, but they mix TLC and SLC depending on, on what they're doing. But I may be wrong about that on the 990. Yeah. So yeah, if we can get PCIe Gen 5 drives at some point in the future, that'll just give us close to double the bandwidth. You know, and like, as you've said before, the Gen 5 drives are still a little bit immature, although they're getting slightly better. I just got a, a Crucial T700 a couple of days ago to play with. So that's another fast consumer drive. Crucial, are you listening? Send us a bunch. Although adapting <laughs> the M.2 into U.2 is a little tricky. I, uh, I reached out to IC Doc and they sent me 16, I think, and I bought eight more or nine more so that we could take M.2 and shove them into U.2. And fun fact, even if you do that, that doesn't mean that M.2 are hot plug. You can put them in the U.2 slot, but they're still not hot plug. If you just shove them in there, they don't work. You have to reboot, and it's probably hard in the M.2, and I'm probably lucky I didn't murder one of them shoving it into something that was not actually hot plug. <sighs> Yeah, well, I think we had a lot of fun playing with these server systems and making them do things they weren't really designed to do, so. Impressive performance, though, for Jen on, uh, like, from your perspective, how is it in terms of, we've seen two or three generations from both Team Red and Team Blue. Uh, it seems to me like the performance Jen on Jen is moving up a lot, which people running SQL workloads can benefit from, but, you know, what are, what are your thoughts? Well... 
you know, a lot of times your CPU performance is extremely important to SQL Server, and a lot of people don't seem to realize that. They just focus on I.O. performance. But if you don't have any other bottlenecks, your single-threaded CPU performance is your final bottleneck. So the latest generation CPU releases are making a big difference for a lot of workloads, you know, assuming you don't have any other bottlenecks to run into. So there have been some pretty big jumps and I'm really anxious to see more and more people start to use Sapphire Wrap and Genoa for SQL Server. Do you think the fact that the last couple generations of CPU pretty much have boost performance baked in? I mean, I know Intel Xeons have been doing boost for a long time, but certainly I've worked with other database administrators who disable. It's like, oh, we're going to disable all power management and we're going to disable everything in the cores. We'll always run at the same speed for consistency. And now that seems like you're shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, that used to be a really big deal. Power management would make a huge difference for SQL Server on older generation CPUs, but the newer ones handle that a lot better and they throttle up a lot more quickly. So you don't necessarily have to go in and do that like you did. Or if you do it, it doesn't make as much of a difference as it did in the past. So you're absolutely right there. Yeah, fun times. Can you think of any other tips or tricks or anything else you want to share? Well, not really. I mean, just the one thing I think people should take away from this is you want to do striped backups to get more performance, even if you've got a fairly slow I.O. subsystem. That makes a huge difference. So, yeah, that's probably the biggest easy takeaway from this. It would be pretty easy with the uh, with the PowerShell facilities in modern SQL Server. You could do a PowerShell uh, command that does the striped backup and then collects the files and deposits them on a remote system or forwards them or, or or linearizes the fact that now your backups are spread across a whole bunch of different devices. Yeah, well, I mean, there's existing tools. There's a guy named Ola Hallengren, who's another SQL Server MVP, who has a tool that's been around for quite a few years that already supports striped backups as sort of a free utility, and it works really well. So, yeah. Nice. So this was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how acceleration works and how acceleration works specifically with SQL Server because Microsoft's actually done a really good job making sure that the way that it uses the hardware acceleration doesn't impinge on things that are running on the CPU because that could negatively impact the actual thing it's trying to do as far as be a database server. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff you can learn here and you can learn all that from, from Glenn's blog and also his YouTube channel. So you should definitely check that out. You wanna, you wanna say anything about it, the last thing you blogged about or your articles or you know fun tips and tricks? I mean, if you have to live this daily, you really should check it out. Uh. No, that sort of <clears throat> caught me by surprise. But I mean, I, I blog fairly regularly and I'm trying to build my YouTube channel. So there'll be more content coming soon. So yeah, I, you know, I focus on SQL Server and from, from a hardware perspective, which is sort of unusual, so. Well, certainly there needs to be more of that because uh, there've been some messes that I've cleaned up, not, with, not on the Microsoft side, but just with databases in general, where it's like, oh, look at that, there's no keys. Wow, how is this working at all? <laughs> Oh yeah. No, that's, that keeps me employed. So, you know, <laughs> and if you're, you know, a home lab enthusiast working on SQL server, you don't need a 96 core Genoa system to do it. You can do it with a 16 core Threadripper with its, you know, commodity DDR4 memory. I mean, look at these numbers in this spreadsheet. This tiny little 16 core system is within spitting distance of these monster systems. So yeah, it's pretty good. Really? Yeah. Nope, you can build a pretty fast system for a lot less money if you're willing to get your hands dirty, so. And I guarantee you that system runs circles around a lot of systems that people work with every day in the enterprise. Oh, absolutely, no <laughs> doubt about that. <laughs> I could detect the horror in, in your chuckle, like <laughs> the suffering of day job. Uh. Oh yeah. All right, well, thank you very much for joining me. Well, it was great to be here. I really appreciated working with you and having you be my server monkey. So that was fun. No problem. And we're going to do more of it, I'm sure, because uh, we need to know. Inquiring minds want to know. Isn't that All right. <laughs>